Hello YouTube, so originally I was going to do my follow-up video against the anarcho-capitalists in the form of a video essay format, but since it would make it too easy for them to strum in me, I decided to do it in more of a response format. Hey there, so for those of you who don't know, and that's probably a lot of you, this is a D-tier commentary channel by the name of XBL Spartan X 170 and he's made quite a few videos responding to anarchist YouTubers such as Atomic Ancap, Filthy Heretic, Shane Killian, Mr. Dapperton, and myself from a perspective of a an unapologetically right-wing millennial libertarian conservative with a firm belief in the nation state, objective morality, pro life, and a firm rejection of globalism. Whether it comes from either the communists or the anarchists. Now, you all know that I don't really like responding to videos which were directed at someone else, but I'm going to make an exception today because, for one thing, this guy is hilariously autistic and easily offended. For example, Razor Fist made a video where he was insulting John McCain along with pretty much everyone else who's not a normie statist, and this fucking guy made a video getting triggered over it. <laughs> No, I'm not kidding. This is the actual thumbnail of the video that he made. The shit which I used to draw on DeviantArt when I was 15 looks better than this. You can cry about my lack of taste all you like, you fucking titwanks. That tumor is getting a sloppy Seraphim BJ in JC's jacuzzi. I Just what the hell were you thinking, Razor? Listen, I know you claim all you want that... He had it coming in some way, but he forgot one important element that separates genuine retrospective from the sheer malice and bad faith he demonstrated in that one video. Oh man, that that is some genuine outrage right there. So much so that he had to edit in that intense music from Kingdom Hearts or wherever he got that, because someone roasting a political figure is them acting in bad faith apparently, I mean. He's not really making an argument, but he's still arguing in bad faith somehow. Oh, and while you're pearl clutching about John McCain's status as a war veteran and POW, I'm sure you're familiar with the U.S. Senate Select Committee on POW MIA Affairs, correct? Considering that you actually support John McCain, I'm going to take that as a no. Well, this group was a select committee created by the U.S. Senate from 1989 to 1993 with the specific interest interest of investigating POW and soldiers reported MIA who were suspected to be still left behind in various countries within Southeast Asia, primarily focusing on Vietnam but also investigating reports that soldiers were left behind in North Korea following the Korean War. But the Senate viciously rejected this investigation, and in fact, three senators went so far out of their way to ensure that there could be no investigation that they passed a bill which classified information relating to the Vietnam War and what the government knew about possible living soldiers that were still in Southeast Asia officially classified as MIA. The three senators, Bob Smith, John Kerry, and, you guessed it, John McCain. There are lots of talking suits who play war games and politics for their own benefit or, as I've pointed out, to sustain the state by manipulating markets. Very few of them are actually bastardly enough to have themselves been soldiers who actively betrayed other soldiers from the wars they were in. There's a reason people absolutely despise John McCain beyond his politics, and that's because he was legitimately a disgusting person who was fucking horrible even by neocon standards. Now, despite his channel being called XBL Spartan X170, he goes by the name The Night Watchman, which should basically tell you all you need to know about his view of politics. Though I don't know why he doesn't just call his channel The Night Watchman, since he'd probably get more viewers if he did. Personally, I like to refer to him as the Hamsburglar, since his avatar kind of reminds me of the Hamburglar. Or, if I feel like being as edgy as he wants to portray himself as, the 24th Chromosome, since that name gives off a pretty antagonistic and somewhat foreboding auspice. And, there are at least 23 other YouTubers which have avatars that are wearing Plague Doctor masks, all of which put out significantly better content. 
But mainly why I'm responding today is because this guy has promised me a debate and has been silent for the last week. I want him to be on an episode of the Cool Capitalist Kids podcast, and I am greatly offended by this refusal from this clearly confident man to debate ideas with me. So I figured I'd make this to get his attention. That and his response to Atomic ANCAP is fucking atrocious. Hello YouTube, so originally I was going to do my follow-up video against the anarcho-capitalists in the form of a video essay format, but since it would make it too easy for them to strum in me, I decided to do it in more of a response format. So, some backstory, because this happened about six to seven months ago, and many of you may not remember this, but it's important. Initially, in his response to Filthy Heretic, he stated that he was going to make a video essay explaining what he thinks are problems with anarcho-capitalism. Filthy Heretic handed his ass to him in a follow-up response, to which he realized that his initial plan to make a video essay was probably not a very good idea. So he consequently looked around ANCAP circles for what he perceived to be low-hanging fruit, found Atomic ANCAP and thought to himself, Whoa, look at this little kid. Kids are generally known to have a flawed conception of how the world works, so instead of actually making a video critiquing this ideology, I'm just gonna make fun of this little kid because kids are talking about politics on the internet, and obviously because kids support it, that means it must not be a very well thought out philosophy. It's not a phase, mom. Anarcho-capitalism is the future. I know it'll work because the non-aggression principle is human nature. This speaks louder about the mentality of the person we're dealing with than anything that I could have said. I see we've already arrived on the anarcho-capitalism is feudalism tweet. I know socialists don't understand political or philosophical ideology any more than a six-year-old who was given a life supply of meth and alcohol, but seriously, can these people learn the difference between the two incredibly different systems that we are talking about here? Feudalism is a system where not only other people's land was taken by force against their will by the order of of the feudal lord, which was which was usually backed by a state, where quote-unquote protection syndicates held people up against their will with weapons drawn and forced them to pay for the quote protection, and peasants were also restricted in terms of weapon ownership. The peasants weren't the helpless pitchfork-wielding rabble-rousers history likes to make them out to be. In fact, they were all well-trained and well-versed in the use of the bow and arrow and kept it their homes in case their kingdom was attacked. And there were in fact a multitude of peasant militia revolts because of this. Completely unrelated to the point which Atomic was making. Atomic's argument is that feudal structures of government operated within a mercantilist economic structure, you know, aside from the fact that they operated within a government, and consequently used force to impose classes where certain people were coerced to exclusively associate in manufacturing for specific commodities with state funding, and these structures were maintained through sumptuary laws, which outlawed citizens from owning certain commodities based on their class within the feudal government, and through the establishment of guilds which were constructs designed to organize workers and control all of the industries. Which, now that I'm describing it, this sounds eerily similar to socialism. I don't know why Atomic didn't point that out. Anyway, there were more groups under feudalism than just peasants and lords, and that's just European feudalism. The feudal structure in Japan had eight classes, of which peasants weren't even the lowest tier, and peasants being able to defend themselves is a complete red herring. The point being made is that anarcho-capitalism and feudalism could not be more diametrically opposed to one another. In fact, it would appear that feudalism has more in common with a Marxist system of government. Also, I find it rather interesting that you don't mention why this is the case. Peasants under feudalism were explicitly not legally allowed to own weaponry under sumptuary laws that was designated for a another class in the feudal hierarchy. Yet, as you've noted, there's a considerable amount of historical evidence to suggest that peasantry owned bows as well as daggers and swords, mainly because police surveillance didn't exist to the extent that it does today. I'll assume that you're not the kind of statist that thinks the state should have a monopoly on munitions, but this is clear proof that if left largely dependent on themselves for their own survival, individuals will act as societies stand 
disbanding militia purely out of their own self-interest. Yeah, because it's not like we believe in this thing called natural law and natural rights, which makes slavery of any kind a violation of human rights. Wait, 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 wait. Who the hell is going to enforce the ban on slavery in an anarcho-capitalist society if there's no laws or government restricting it? Oh, for fuck's sake, not this again. The monopolization of arbiters in society does not establish order. All it does is allow the organization which controls the monopoly to make whatever judgments on rulings that it wants, impose its own will onto people by forcing them to associate with it, outlawing competition, and consequently allowing it to unjustifiably restrict actions which the said citizens are naturally able to do without transgressing against another person, and treat said actions as if there was an actual victim. So the legal system which your praxis aligns with is the the only one in which slavery could actually exist without being ruled against since arbitration is centralized and therefore is solely based on the decisions made by one arbiter. Now the natural law which is being described by Atomic, which was first described by Lysander Spooner in his 1882 essay, which has the absurdly long title of... <sighs> Natural Law or the Science of Justice, a treatise on natural law, natural justice, natural rights, natural liberty, and natural society, showing that all legislation whatsoever is an absurdity, an usurpation, and a crime. Part first. The legal conclusion of this essay came to be more commonly referred to as the non-aggression principle, since just calling it natural law is rather unspecific, and calling it Lysander Spooner's natural law implies that the findings are arbitrary. I'd argue that everyone should read this essay or watch my video on the non-aggression principle in order to understand it in its actual context, because those Nozickian Libertarian Party fuckers have distorted the idea beyond recognition in mainstream political debate simply to attempt and try and justify the state. But to describe it simply, because we know that people have agency, they have to have dominion over themselves, and because people have dominion over themselves, they necessarily also own all of their actions and products of their actions. So as a result, all acts of coercion are inherently unjustified because a coercive action upon another person is a declaration of dominion over them and their agency, a statement that you can own them because you can act upon them in ways which negate their agency. In order to attempt to justify this, you need to either make a logical argument for why your dominion over someone else is legitimate and why despite having agency, the other person can't express dominion over themselves, which for the record before anyone tries, this is not possible, as the reasoning behind it inherently appeals to the logical fallacy of special pleading. Because our rights exist naturally and can be demonstrated to be true, there is no necessity for jurisprudence in society, and jurisprudence cannot exist in a stateless society anyway, as the mere existence of a centralized arbiter results in the formation of a state. In fact, I've recently popularized the argument that the key to statism is solely the monopoly on arbitration, whereas before the common anarchist argument was largely that the state is an organized monopoly on violence. Now this isn't to say that the NAP is human nature, as you've put it, and that humans wouldn't naturally coerce one another. That would be absurd and utopian. This only demonstrates that because there is an objective standard for what our rights are, third-party arbitration and the individual defending their own rights is possible. As self-ownership is a right, and by that logic we apparently believe in racism because we believe that all people are equal in rights despite race. And greed, well, what is greed? Pursuing your self-interest, which has given people things like cars, rockets, and computers, and smartphones? In that case, greed is pretty neat. Ah, simple. Currency in an anarcho-capitalist society is anything mutually agreed upon by any amount of individuals making a transaction. Or you could have companies like Bitcoin and Litecoin creating currencies that have value based on the supply and demand curve. Currency speculation, like what you're suggesting, Cryptocurrency is not currency speculation. Currency speculation is the act of trading one currency for another and profiting from the fluctuating exchange rates. Granted that Atomic's explanation of cryptocurrencies was shit, but that doesn't change the fact that even with the loosest interpretation of what he just said, this is a blatant straw man argument. 
spells disaster for any economy it's implemented in and leads to massive inflation, wealth drain, and people, more and more people are simply going to make money off the trading off the currency itself rather than actually producing anything of equal value themselves. Well, considering that currency speculation doesn't really affect interest rates in any way, nor does it create artificial scarcity, there's no explanatory power behind the claim that it causes economic inflation. And you have to be more specific when you say that it causes wealth drain, because that's just political rhetoric. Yeah, he didn't think through or come up with this argument. In fact, this entire position is essentially word for word the nonsensical and political justification that Richard Nixon gave for abolishing the gold standard, which for the record, the U.S. abolished the gold standard because it could no longer sustain it, for as good as the economy did with the gold standard, see the divide between productivity and real wages after the gold standard was abolished, fiat backed with gold is still fiat, which has the exact same issue with any other kind of fiat, which is that there is nothing limiting the supply of notes which can be put into circulation. Eventually, the currency in question will experience hyperinflation because more notes will be printed into circulation than the amount of reserve backing it, which of course is exactly what happened to the dollar. Charles de Gaulle of France became skeptical of the US's ability to back up the dollar with gold because the French government alone owned multiple times what the US Treasury supposedly held in gold reserves. So France began exchanging their surplus dollars along with many other countries in Western Europe, which caused the U.S. Treasury's gold stock to sharply decline. Yeah, those speculators Nixon was referring to? Those were actually just people and other governments attempting to cash in their dollars for gold, but were unfortunate enough not to understand that the state is not capable of producing more resources, and therefore any currency it attempts to create is unsustainable. And there is absolutely no way in hell that Nixon, or any other president for that matter, is going to admit to the this fundamental flaw with the state, because if they did, everyone would understand that governments are inherently unsustainable and demand for decentralization would skyrocket. Like what they're doing with Bitcoin right now. This was known as the Bretton Woods monetary system. Nigger, <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, so who owns Bitcoin or any of these other cryptocurrencies and, and what reserve commodities backing them up? Damn, son, that's the hottest no-coiner take that I've heard since that idiot on Bloomberg said that cryptocurrency relied on a Marxist theory of value. Which, and is the main reason, Tricky Dick Nixon moved us off the gold standard in the first place. To protect our currency from the speculators, so as to try to curb what was essentially theft of our private wealth by foreign interests and countries. The irony being that the U.S. abolishing the Bretton Woods system so the U.S. didn't have to pay gold to people who traded with the dollar under the assumption that the dollar was worth its value in gold, the government actually scammed most of the world's population. Oh, and fractional reserve banking is literal debt slavery and extortion through the various trade impositions the U.S. has made on other countries around the world, such as OPEC. So no, Bitcoin is not based on the supply and demand curve. Yes it is. Bitcoin has a fixed supply cap of 21 million that can exist in circulation, which gives it scarcity, so supply, and Bitcoin is incredibly fungible, durable, and it's a preferred medium of exchange, so it has utility, meaning that it has demand. This isn't something unique to cryptocurrencies, by the way. All commodities have supply and demand curves that includes currencies. The problem with fiat, again, goes back to the fact that the state cannot produce commodities. It can only redistribute through force. For one, there's no supply curve because the Federal Reserve can just have the Treasury Department print more money anytime they want. And because the state's not capable of creating commodities, it cannot create a currency which has all the necessary characteristics required mentioned earlier in regard to what gives currency its value. Newsflash. Since private companies don't have an illegitimate monopoly on force and coercion, and so cannot coerce or force people into things like that, they can only survive off making a living through profit, private tyrannies don't exist, and they can never exist. <laughs>
Oh shit, he's about to try and name an example of a private tyranny. Hedge your bets, folks. How much do you want to bet he's going to cite an example of the state doing something? Well, you'd be stupid to have bet against me, because Atomic literally just explained why that can never happen. Alright, show me your example of a private tyranny so I can point out how the state was the actual cause. The British East India Company was a private corporation that used its private army to invade and enslave groups of people for their own profit. The East India Trade Company was a state-backed firm established by the British monarchy while Britain was still practicing feudalism for the sole purpose of attempting to monopolize trade routes in the Indian Ocean. It was entirely state-funded and was so disastrously unprofitable that it was essentially one of the main influences that inspired economists of the day to start questioning whether or not mercantilism was a viable economic model. Even if it were a private company, it would have to have utilized the state in order to perform its primary functions, since its primary functions operated around coercion. This isn't even corporatism, this is just an example of straight up state management. Your own motherfucking citation, the Wikipedia article, goes into detail on multiple occasions how the state created the company and how it had a monopoly established by Queen Elizabeth I's royal charter. But they never teach you this in high school. And since you're still young, I'll cut you some slack. And I know you're not trying to deliberately mislead people. I just thought I'd share that inconvenient example of a historical, private tyranny. All they fucking teach you in high school econ is how evil private business is and doing exactly what you just did by providing an example of state management or state interference in the market, then blame it on the market. That's probably where you learned your bullshit interpretation of history. Sure, they can violate it or follow it, but the NAP is not arbitrary, logic is not arbitrary, and rights are not arbitrary. And yet, what makes you so sure that the NAP is part of human nature? Mr. Strummer, give me a break. Since you are only about 14, I doubt you know much about the truth of human nature or how people actually work. If you want to know how people actually work, take a psychology class as soon as possible. I'd advise you to do the same, because if you did, you'd know about a phenomenon known as reactance. Humans are instinctively compelled to reject what we perceive as limitations to our autonomy. Therefore, a state could have never formed on a voluntary basis and had to have come into existence through violent coercion. Anyway, can't wait for the debate.